Back when I was a wee lad, I checked out a picture book from my library. It was called something like Dinosaurs That Live on Mountains, with a pretty self-explanatory subject matter. Now, it's seemingly disappeared off the face of the earth, as the dinosaurs did, so I can't find any pictures of it, but trust me, it exists. My child imagination sparked at the ideas the book presented. Dinosaurs, popularly creatures of flat jungles and swamps, living in the cold, steep mountains, along with goats and Scottish people? Crazy. Sadly, as I grew from a child to a monotone, faceless voice on the internet, I realized most of the book was wrong. From what I recall, a lot of the dinosaur species in the book were from pretty standard fossil beds that would have been mountainless back in the Mesozoic. There really aren't many mountain dinosaurs. But why is that? Were dinosaurs really not into skiing and hiking that much? Well, considering the sheer diversity of the dinosaurs we do know, some certainly lived in upland environments. Why we don't have any of these is a product of the oh-so-sinister preservation bias. Fossilization is an incredibly rare process, and only has a chance of forming in some favorable situations. Organisms that are fossilized must ward off decaying away or being destroyed by weathering, and the best way to do this is by being buried and preserved quickly, usually by water moving mud over the body. As well, permineralization, one of the most common fossilization processes, requires minerals to seep into the dead cells to form rock in the shape of the organism. These minerals commonly come from water. Hey, this water stuff seems pretty important to the fossilization process. I wonder where it likes to be. Well, as shown in my highly scientific experiment, not anywhere with elevation. This unfortunately includes mountains. Fossils also generally like pretty stagnant bodies of water as well. So even when there is water on a mountain, these fast flowing creeks make poor places for fossilization. Fossils also generally prefer not to be weathered, which happens to mountains all the time. So because of this, organisms in flat areas of swamps and floodplains will have a significantly better chance of being fossilized than their friends in the mountains. So it's not that there were no dinosaurs living in the mountains, but maybe even sadder, the ones who were will be lost time forever. Except of course for these guys. Yes, fossilizing mountain animals is difficult, but not impossible. There do exist a few examples in the fossil record. The Green River Formation of the Rocky Mountains preserves aquatic life who lived in one of the few situations where calm waters are found among mountains, intermountain lakes. It'd be pretty similar to Lake Tahoe minus the Californians. From the lake beds, the formation preserves a diverse array of fish fossils, and some you may or may not expect from the Rocky Mountains 50 million years ago. Animals like stingrays, a fox-sized ancestor of the horse, Hyracotherium, and even early caimans, who are now found in the warm tropics of Central and South America. On the other side of the country lies yet another depository of highland life. The Appalachian Mountains are some of the oldest still standing on our planet. Hundreds of millions of years ago, they would be as high as the Himalayas, but by the early time of the dinosaurs, some 200 million years ago, they had already begun to weather away. Miraculously, a geologic formation preserves a window into highland or highland adjacent life during this place in time. Doubly as miraculous since, as anyone from the East Coast should know, dinosaurs from that half of the country are disappointingly rare. This assemblage of formations about the Atlantic seaboard is known as the Newark Supergroup, unfortunately named after the man-made purgatory of Newark, New Jersey. And it does not preserve just dinosaurs, but many other early Mesozoic reptiles who the dinosaurs would eventually overcome in the preceding periods. Now, I give you all of this information with some extreme caution. I could find only one good paper on the animals of the supergroup, with some pretty vague wording on whether these are mountain animals or not. But with that being said, there are some interesting creatures present in these upland rocks. Some of the earliest dinosaurs of the Jurassic, like the Coelophysoid Podecosaurus and Prosauropod Amosaurus, have been described. Both smaller than humans, they would be the ancestors of some of the mightiest land animals to ever walk the earth. For now, they lived in the shadow of bizarre rulers from older times. From slightly older rock, we find traces of the Raisukids, who pass as dinosaurs at first glance, but are in fact a group of distantly related reptiles who hunted in the Triassic period. 
Other strange Triassic animals from the supergroup's upland rocks include the squat Sclerosaurus, and an old friend of the channel, Big Man Tan Tanistrophius, and his god-given neck. There also appears to be a share of fossils from intermountain lakes, preserving aquatic life here. Fish and mollusks were present, as well as the gaping maws of labyrinthodonts, primordial amphibians who in some cases grew humongous. There are traces of other creatures from the Newark supergroup. Footprints may correlate to the existence of two large predators in the early Jurassic, one dinosaur and the other a land-based crocodile. But all of these remains are scant and relatively unknown, and the bizarre early world of the Appalachian Hills has, in my opinion, yet to be given the attention it needs. But to find what I feel is the most exciting of these formations, one must go back west into the state of Idaho to find the extraordinary Wyan Formation. Preserving a chunk of the Cretaceous about 100 million years ago, the Wyan is a pretty special formation only beginning to be dissected and understood by paleontologists. Now to explain the Wyan, I have an expert on the formation and the museum education head at the Idaho Museum of Natural History, Robert Gay. So one of the interesting things about the Wayan Formation is that it represents this more upland environment than you would get from a lot of these traditional Cretaceous basins. You know, we talk about places like the Cedar Mountain Formation or the Cloverly Formation, and the faunas from these places are well known, and these are low-lying floodplains relatively close to the coast. But the Wayan is contemporaneous with these uh, and these other formations to a certain extent, and that is much further upland, so you have more, uh, you have less deposition and you have greater erosion occurring uh, with these higher energy streams because you're closer to the source um, of these, these rivers, these ancestral Rocky Mountains. If you overlap a modern map of the states on the Cretaceous continent of Laramidia, you can see what Robert's talking about. While many other famous formations from states like Montana and Colorado line the coast of the western interior seaway, Idaho is much further inland, where the young Rocky Mountains had risen and thundering mountain rivers would flow. The other formations that surrounded the Wyan are as interesting as any other time in Cretaceous North America. Preserving a time before T. rex and Triceratops, the environment of the earlier Cretaceous North America would have been populated by massive sauropods, armored ankylosaurs, scrappy early tyrannosaurs like Moros, and the mysterious apex predator who reigned over them, Seats. It is not a crazy leap to say you would probably find many of these animals living in the valleys of the baby Rockies, and in fact there is some evidence creatures like these were found in the Wyan. But of course, with the limitations of mountain fossilizations, most are very fragmentary remains. For instance, a mystery tooth and some other bones may be from a theropod dinosaur of huge proportions, as large as an allosaurus. And indeed it is very possible this is from a Seat-like animal. Although the fossils are so sparse, it's hard to make any bold assumptions. Other clues about the environment of the Wyan exist as well. So we've got a Tyrannosaur that was recently published, but it's not a complete Tyrannosaur, it's just a femur, you know, a partial femur at that. So we can make comparisons, but we don't, we aren't able to say, yes, this is exactly the same as Moros or Suski Tyrannus. We have Ceratopsian teeth, but we don't know what Ceratopsian these things go to. Yet there were also those that were distinctly Wyan animals. The awesomely named Gigantoraptor is not found anywhere in North America, instead being a native of Cretaceous China. Looking like a parrot crossed with a street lamp, these beaked behemoths are some of the most bizarre dinosaurs yet identified. For a while it appeared American dinosaurs didn't have to fear these things pecking them to death, but we thought wrong. Although no Gigantoraptor has been properly described from the Wyan, a mysterious clutch of eggs was discovered among the hills. These eggs are humongous, 40 centimeters long. You know who else had 40 centimeter long eggs? That's right. They are even shaped pretty identically. Both the Wyan eggs and Gigantoraptor eggs belong to the same Uo species, or egg fossil species. So there was presumably some bizarre giant dinosaur living among the young Rockies that at least shared some resemblance to a Gigantoraptor. It's too early now to say if it was just as large as the Gigantoraptor. Maybe it was even larger and more bizarre. Who knows? But one of the Wyan's much more well-preserved organisms is also much more humble at first glance, but just as interesting. 
Orictodromius was the size of a sheep, pretty underwhelming by dinosaur standards, but it is a one-of-a-kind among its peers. You see, Erectodromius, with its strong fused beak and robust shoulders and arms, appears to be the first clear example of a burrowing dinosaur. Not convinced by that? Well, we also find many of them dead in their burrows. Indeed, many Erectodromia skeletons appear to be fossilized in an optimal situation, with little wear and tear inside the infilled chamber of a burrow large enough to fit these animals. A couple of Erectodromia's burrows also has not just one adult, but several juvenile specimens as well. From this, paleontologists infer the dinosaurs raised and sheltered its young in its lair. In certain sites in the YN, there's also a possibility Erectodromia's placed their burrows near neighbors, like puffins. A few concentrations of the species are found during the same time of burial, only several meters apart. The full burrowing behaviors of these animals have not been fully constructed yet, but to even have a sheep-sized dinosaur digging around the Cretaceous highlands really is one of the most incredible things about the YN. The Erectodromius is also one of the formation's most dominant life forms, being easily the most abundant and well-preserved of any dinosaur present. Now, this is probably partly due to it being a common animal among the mountains, but that sneaky preservation bias also certainly played a role. We have an overabundance, one would say, of its fossils here in Idaho because it was spending at least a large chunk of its life underground in burrows. It's been described as a fossorial or burrowing organism. And if you're in an environment like the way Anne was during the Cretaceous, where you have high erosion, and low deposition, having yourself be pre-buried in a burrow living underground increases your chances for fossilization. That's one of the big stories we see from the way in here, is that these things, whether they're dinosaurs or whether they're eggs, things that are pre-buried, or at least partially buried, and don't have as much of an ability to leave when you have a seasonal flood or something like this, are going to have a higher chance of being preserved in our fossil record. So even in formations where we have fossils, the limits of preserving in mountain environments have hindered our grasp on the ecosystem. Still, the YN is a relatively unexplored fossil formation, and the attention it's getting from paleontologists has slowly increased over the years as they realize the potential this place holds. So everything that's happening now, all these fossils and discoveries that we're talking about, we're just barely starting to scratch the tip of the iceberg here. and. As the years go on, we are expecting to see more and more amazing fossil discoveries coming out of our little slice of Idaho Cretaceous rock. I couldn't have worded it better myself. Young me would be very excited for times like these. Although very rare, there is certainly a whole mountain <laughs> of prehistoric highland fossils in the Wayan and formations just like it waiting to be uncovered. And as paleontology advances, I am certain we will learn more about those dinosaurs of the mountains. There's a lot of thank yous to hand out for this one. Firstly, a huge thanks to Robert Gay, who provided me with many excellent articles, answered tons of questions, and of course gave me a great interview about the YN. The entire thing's on my Patreon if you want to check it out. As well, another shout out to my music man Dara Hughes, who also put out some new content on Spotify that you should all check out. Of course, thanks to the image videos and articles I used to make this video. Also, thank you for watching. Thank you so much for that. See you.